Okay, folks, well, uh, believe it or not, this is the last lecture of the semester. Um, and even though I live in Macon, I think I just heard some cheering coming from Milledgeville. Uh, so anyway, we're at the uh, at chapter 14 on evaluation approaches and designs. And um, as I said in class, there's a lot of uh, detail here. Uh, a lot of the stuff is very similar to what you might have had or are having in a research class, and so uh, maybe some of this information will be familiar. But uh, even though it's um, you know common to research, we're going to be applying it to um, to program evaluation. All right, so here are the uh, learning objectives for the class. Um, you know, being able to describe the difference between formative and summative evaluation, and as well as uh, the relationship to process impact and outcome evaluation. If you remember back to the precede proceed model, um, the last three phases of the precede proceed model on the uh, uh, proceed side of things is process, impact, and outcome evaluation. Um, identifying the elements and strategies used to do formative and process evaluation, and uh, listing the important considerations in selecting a research or an evaluation design and then being able to compare and contrast quantitative and qualitative methods of evaluation. Um, list the various qualitative methods that can be used in evaluation and research, and then differentiate between experimental control and comparison groups. Um, compare and contrast the major types of evaluation designs, and then finally identify the threats to internal and external validity and explain how uh, you can control those things um, with your research design. Okay, so here's the key terms. Uh, I've tried to get these all on one page. Um, I'll let you take a look at those. Uh, a lot of these have to do with um, uh, conducting a comprehensive uh, formative evaluation uh, you know, with your evaluation methods, but then there are some other things that pertain to uh, it research design stuff. Okay, so a reminder that uh, evaluation is a process of determining the value or worth of a health promotion program based on predetermined criteria or standards of acceptability. Okay, so we're trying to determine uh, whether or not the things that we do are um, uh, quality in terms of, uh, you know, criteria or standards. And so a couple more terms here, uh, the concept of an evaluation framework, which is the skeleton of the plan for conducting the evaluation. And uh, you'll see that later on when we talk about uh, evaluation designs and then the actual evaluation design, which organizes the evaluation uh, to provide for planned systematic data collection, analysis, and reporting. And so it ensures that the conclusions that uh, are drawn at the end of the evaluation can be as accurate as possible. And we can have confidence in what it is that we conclude. All right, so um, here are the elements of a comprehensive formative evaluation. And remember, the formative evaluation takes place periodically throughout the, uh, the course of a health promotion program where we're trying to get feedback from participants and make some changes, adapt as we go along on the fly. Um, and so, you know, here's some terms here. Justification refers to whether or not the uh, health promotion program is... Um, is warranted or is it justified? Uh, Evidence-based, we've looked at that term before. We want to use uh, intervention strategies that have been proven to be effective so that they're based on uh, evidence that's been gathered you know, over the years. Uh, capacity means, you know, do we have, uh, does our organization have the, the skills? Does it have the necessary personnel to be able to do the the health promotion program, uh, resources, and we'll look a little bit more in detail at this one, but obviously do we have the, uh, the staff and the funding and so on to be able to do it. Uh, consumer orientation, you know, we're, we're uh, in this with our, uh, our participants, and so we want to be able to get feedback from them uh, in the formative evaluation that tells us how things are going. Multiplicity, we've seen that term before. That just means that with these complex health problems like diabetes, obesity, and so on, um, no one strategy is going to make the difference. So we need to do multiple things um, so that we can have the greatest impact. So multi multiplicity refers to using multiple interventions. 
uh, support has to do with are we providing our participants with the appropriate uh, tools that they need uh, as they go through the program. So, for example, if you know we find out that somebody has hypertension, high blood pressure, you know, is there a mechanism for them to go and uh, and and get that looked after? Inclusion, uh, we want to make sure that uh, we're including um, all elements of the priority population and not excluding anyone. Uh, so this has to do with diversity. Uh, accountability means that we are um, uh, obviously um, accountable to the people that are funding us and to the, the priority population. And so all of our methods and procedures need to be done with that in mind. Uh, recruitment, you know, how do we go about getting people in from the priority population into our programs and are we doing things that um, you know allow for the most people to be included you know reach is what percentage of the priority population are we actually uh, getting to and then response is what percentage of the priority population uh, even though they know about it what percent are actually participating in the program that's response uh, interaction is the relationship that we develop with the priority population, so the professionals that are running the program and the participants. Uh, you know, how is that interaction? Um, uh, you know, are, are we being trust? Are we gaining their trust? Are we being accepted, and so on? And then, of course, satisfaction is: are the participants satisfied with the program as it's being offered, or are there any changes that need to be made? Okay, so drilling down a little bit deeper on the resources aspect of the comprehensive program evaluation, uh, we have three things here, cost identification, cost benefit, and cost effectiveness. And obviously the word cost is in each of those, and so we're looking at the amount of money expended for the benefits that are, uh, are received. So cost identification, if we're doing multiple interventions, it's going to look at... Um, you know, which of the interventions is the least expensive, you know, which is the most expensive, uh, are we, you know, expending our funds in the appropriate way. And then cost-benefit is the, you know, the benefits received in terms of finances versus the dollars invested. Um, a good example of this is in uh, trail building. Um, it's often said that, you know, for every dollar you invest in building a trail, you're going to see a fourfold um, uh, benefit coming back to you. So, you know, we, you build a trail in a community and you get people coming to ride the trail and those people are going to be staying in hotels and spending money on food and uh, fuel and all of that kind of stuff. And so it's basically a four to one benefit versus investment. And the cost effectiveness then looks at uh, how much your action, how much is it actually costing you to uh, achieve a desired benefit or a certain effect? Okay. All right. So here are some of the uh, the methods and the tools that are used in formative evaluation. Uh, some of these things we've seen in previous chapters, but focus groups are small. Um, groups of participants that we invite to come and give us some feedback about how things are going. Surveys, obviously, doesn't need any explanation. Uh, In-depth interviews, uh, you know, those tend to be more open-ended questions and probing questions, allowing people to go, uh, uh, go deeper into things. Um, informal interviews, you know, might be just um, you know, asking somebody in the hallway how things are going. Um, you know, just nothing really structured, but just getting some, some informal feedback at, at certain points in time. Uh, key informant interviews, <clears throat> so you identify people in the community or in the priority population that speak for others, and uh, you get their feedback, and they're allowed, and they, and they, uh, they can tell you, um, you know, how other people are feeling as well as how they are. Uh, direct observation is what it says. So, you know, you just are watching, you're observing, and you're making uh, notes or making observations about how things are going. Um, you know, if it's a children's program, you know, are the kids interested? Are they attentive? Are they losing focus? Uh, you can learn that, um, you know, through observation. Uh, expert panel reviews are, you know, getting individuals from outside your program who are experts to come in and uh, 
uh, take a look and give you some info, you know, feedback about how things are going. Uh, quality circles is similar to focus groups, but it's the program staff. And so uh, staff members that might be responsible for the nutrition aspect of a program, you know, they get together periodically and they um, talk to each other about how things are going. Uh, individuals that might be involved in the physical activity portion of a program. You know, they get together, they're a quality circle, uh, and they talk about how things are going there. Uh, protocol checklists uh, are just, um, you know, tools that you can use to determine whether or not you're staying on track. Similarly, with the Gantt chart, which we saw um, in the last uh, chapter, I believe, but it's just a way of monitoring the degree of progress on some of the tasks that you have to accomplish. And then, of course, there are program and evaluation forms that uh, can be used to do this formative evaluation. Okay, so now we come to summative evaluation. So if formative takes place throughout a program, summative takes place at the end. So any combination of measurements that allow conclusions to be drawn about the impact or outcome of a program. And so here's where we get a little bit uh, researchy. Uh, so the concept of independent variables, dependent variables, and compounding variables. Um, you know, the independent variable is the thing that you do. It's the program, uh, and you observe the effect of the program on the dependent variables. So what impact did the independent variable have on the dependent variable? So, your dependent variables might be risk factors for cardiovascular disease, so hypertension, blood pressure, um, cholesterol, things like that. And so the independent variable then is the program that you do and you want to do the program. You would probably um, pre-test people on the, the dependent variables and then after the program you would post-test them again and you'd see how much change happened uh, on those risk factors. Confounding variables are anything that happens uh, throughout the course of the, um, of the program that could impact the, the findings or it could impact you know, what's going on with the dependent variables. So um, it's called confounding because it, it sort of muddies the water. And they're variables that you can't control and they impact your ability to say that the uh, change in the dependent variable was caused by the independent variable. All right, so when you're uh, selecting an evaluation design, you know, you need to ask yourself some questions. How much time do you have to do this? What financial resources are available? How many participants are you going to include? And the more participants that you have, then um, the uh, better able you're, you are to be able to, to determine um, impact. Um, are you going to use a qualitative uh, design? Or are you going to use a quantitative design? Or are you going to use both, what we'd call a mixed methods? And um, uh, mixed methods designs that include both qualitative and quantitative methods are very powerful approaches, and I certainly would recommend that you do um, you know, mixed methods evaluation because it's uh, you know, really the way to go these days. Do you have data analysis skills or access to statistical consultants? Um, you know, I know you probably learned how to use SPSS in your research class or are learning that, um, but uh, you know, it might be wise to, um, uh, to do what you can do, but also to seek out people that are experts in, in doing that kind of stuff. Uh, what are some ways that you can uh, increase the validity of your designs? Um, do you want to generalize your findings to other populations? That's the concept of um, external validity that we'll look at here in a little bit. Uh, if that's the case, then there are certain things that you definitely need to do. Uh, are your stakeholders concerned with validity and reliability? And uh, you know the answer to that is yes. So you always need to use uh, tools that have been proven to be valid and reliable. Otherwise, you're not going to get uh, data that's worth anything. Uh, are you able to randomize participants into experimental and control groups? Um, as we'll see here in a little bit, that idea of being able to randomize or randomly assign participants to the different groups protects you against a lot of threats to both internal and external validity. 
Um, do you have access to what's called a comparison group? And we'll see what that is here in a second. Uh, and so, um, you know, now we're on to uh, the qualitative methods that are used in evaluation. I mentioned that, um, you know, powerful designs use both qualitative and quantitative uh, methods. Uh, here are some things that you can do in terms of qualitative evaluation. So case study approaches, uh, content analysis of interviews, um, the Delphi technique, and over on the other side, nominal group process. We looked at those, you know, way back in chapter five, I believe. Um, ethnographic studies or participant study where the, the researcher actually, you know, lives with the priority population and uh, really, really studies them kind of from the inside out. Um, videos, photographs, films, you know, those can be used, uh, analyzed um, in qualitative evaluation. Focus groups we mentioned earlier, um, history or historical analysis, um, in-depth interviews we already mentioned. Um, kinesics is really the study of um, of movement, um, and so you know that can be an evaluation tool. Uh, participant observer studies, you know, where the, um, the the researcher or the evaluator actually becomes a participant and um, again studies things from the inside out. Uh, quality circles we mentioned, and then unobtrusive techniques or observation techniques where you you know, are not, not actually present. You may be um, analyzing a, a film or a video, or you may be looking at something through a, uh, you know, one-way glass so that they can't see you. They don't know that you're there. Okay, so, you know, now we get to the concept of uh, groups in, in, in evaluation design. So the experimental group, the control group, and the comparison group. So the experimental or the treatment group are those individuals that are receiving the intervention or are participating in the program. Uh, a control group, you know, they're similar to the experimental group in all respects, but they don't get the intervention um, or the, the program. And so they just uh, serve as a reference point, essentially. Uh, you would expect the experimental group to change because they're getting the program. But as we know, and as we'll see uh, later when we look at the threats to uh, validity, um, it's possible for the control group to change um, for a number of reasons. And so you, that's why we have a control group because um, we try to isolate the effects on the experimental group. But if we don't have a control group for uh, comparative purposes, then um, you know, we really can't tease that out. And then a comparison group, when you can't assign or you can't randomly assign subjects to um, the experimental or a control group, then what you are left with is finding a group that's similar, uh, and that becomes what we call a comparison group. So again, when there's no randomization that happens, um, then you have a comparison group as opposed to a control group. All right, so uh, again, you've probably seen this before um, in research class, but uh, there are three categories of evaluation designs, uh, experimental designs, quasi-experimental designs, and non-experimental designs. And um, I'll say right now, um, you know, stay away from non-experimental designs because they're virtually useless. They don't protect you against any type of, or, or many, um, if any, uh, threats to internal and external validity, and they really, um, you know, should not be utilized. Uh, there's a place for experimental and, and quasi-experimental that we'll see here in a minute, but uh, again, stay away from number three. All right, so uh, as we look at some different types of evaluation designs, um, you know, you need to understand a little bit of, of uh, notation here. So when you see an R, that indicates that there's been a random assignment of uh, participants to various groups. Uh, the X indicates that that particular group is getting uh, the treatment or being exposed to the program. And an O is where an observation is being made. Uh, so some, some type of data collection is, is happening. So experimental designs um, offer the greatest control over 
uh, factors that could affect the results, you know, what we termed earlier confounding variables. It involves randomly assigning subjects to uh, either the experimental group or the control group. So people come into uh, uh, a study or a program and they don't know whether they're going to get it or not. Um, so they're just they're randomly assigned and that controls for some of the threats to internal and external validity that we'll look at. And uh, so that's what the third bullet point here says. Uh, Post-test only design. Um, so you've got that concept of randomization. You don't do any pre-testing. All you do is post-test. Um, you know, the reason that you might be able to get away with that is because the random assignment of subjects to groups should take care of any differences that might occur you know, prior to um, a program starting. So the groups should be equal because of this concept of randomization. And so there really isn't a need to, um, to do any uh, pre-testing. All you need to do is test them afterwards. And then you'd be comparing uh, the observation on the experimental group to the control group. All right, here's uh, some more complicated types of designs. Um, you know, number three is your time series design. And so you're making multiple measurements uh, prior to a program starting. That's the X, remember. Uh, and so you're establishing a baseline, a good solid baseline, by uh, measuring the experimental and the control group three different times. Uh, then they get the program, one group gets the program, and then you do another series of measurements uh, afterwards. And, and there you can be looking for, um, you know, whether or not the effect of the treatment is diminishing over time. So, uh, you know, are, are people, you know, losing, if, if it's a, a knowledge thing that you expect them to gain, are they losing that knowledge uh, as time goes on, uh, you know, among the, the 04, 05, and 06? Um, staggered treatment design is, uh, you know, very complex, but a very powerful design. So uh, in this case, you know, you have um, four different uh, experimental groups and they each serve as their own control because they get the treatment at different times and you're making measurements at different times. And so notice that there's no control group here because the experimental groups by virtue of, um, you know, how we're uh, doing things and when the treatment gets administered, they serve basically as their own controls. All right, now quasi-experimental, uh, we see this a lot in, in health promotion programs and community health uh, because sometimes it's just not possible to randomly assign um, uh, participants to the treatment groups. So, you know, for example, if we were looking at um, uh, you know, two fourth grade classrooms and, you know, one classroom was getting this uh, reading program and the other one wasn't. Um, you know, we don't have any way of, um, you know, assigning students to the two different classes. The classes are already formed and so we basically just, um, uh, just go with it, okay? And so that, you know, limits um, some of your control over uh, internal validity. Um, it's better than non-experimental studies, but uh, you know it, it does have its limitations. But again, sometimes we we have to do that. Um, same thing would be if we were you know doing some sort of a study that compared males and females. You know those uh, you know males are males and females are females. There's no concept of randomization there. All right, and so, um, you know, you see some different quasi-experimental designs here, and if you compare these to the uh, experimental designs, you'll see that they're, you know, equal in all respects, except they don't have the R there, which indicates the uh, randomization of a pool of subjects into the experimental and uh, comparison group. And again, notice that we're not using the, the word control now, because we haven't been able to randomize, so we can't call it a control group, so we have to call it a comparison group. All right, so your pretest, post-test design, again, you know, identical to the pretest, post-test experimental design, except you don't have the randomization. Same thing with the time series design. Um, everything's the same except for randomization. All right, and then uh, non-experimental, you know, very primitive designs. Um, you know, they only show 
that a group has changed as a result of, of getting the treatment, but because you don't have any comparison group or control group, you know, you really can't say a lot about that. So it doesn't control for, you know, very much in terms of internal validity. So again, here's a, uh, you know, non-experimental pretest, post-test design. You've just got one group. They get the program. You measure them at the beginning. You measure them at the end. You might see a difference, but you don't know if a, um, a similar group of people that didn't get the treatment would change because of stuff that might be going on. Um, the time series design, again, same kind of thing. No comparison or control group. All right, so we mentioned uh, this, this concept of internal validity. It's really, really important. Um, so an inter internal validity allows us to say that the change that was observed was caused by the program or caused by the independent variable. So, um, you know, if you, if you can't say that at the end of a program, then what do you have, really? <clears throat> you know, if you can't say that your program produced the changes in the individuals, then, you know, really, um, you know, something's gone very wrong. So we always want to strive to, to have internal validity where we can say that the changes that we saw in our participants were due to the program that we implemented. <clears throat> so there are a lot of things that can affect uh, internal validity. Uh, you know, here's a, <clears throat> uh, here's a good long list, and uh, I'll explain each of these. Um, <clears throat> I encourage you to, to read the corresponding uh, section in the book and that chapter and um, you know see if you can uh, drill down a little bit and get a little bit more detail. <clears throat> history is not necessarily what you think it is. History is stuff that might occur while you're administering your program that you hadn't counted on that could uh, influence the results. So I'll give you an example. You know, we were doing, uh, started in 2010, doing childhood obesity prevention with Live Healthy Baldwin. Obviously, we want to see um, people's um, activity patterns increasing. We want to see them eating healthier. You know, during the course of us doing our program here in, in Milledgeville, Michelle Obama came out with, um, you know, her uh, Let's Move program. You know, we didn't know that was going to happen, but it happened. And so a lot of people were, you know, kind of paying attention to that. And maybe they were making some changes because of less, Let's Move as opposed to, you know, Live Healthy Baldwin. So that was something that happened, you know, during the time that we were doing stuff that, you know, potentially uh, could affect whether or not people change behaviors or changed attitudes. Uh, maturation, when you're dealing with children, you know, children are going to change over a year or two years or three years. They're going to grow. They're going to mature. Uh, they're going to develop, you know, muscles. Um, uh, you know, that's just things that you have to, you know, keep in mind. And that's a really good reason for having a control group or a comparison group because, uh, you know, because they're going to change, um, then you need to be able to try to isolate what's, what change is happening as a result of the program and what's happening as a result of them just growing and maturing. Uh, testing is the fact that as we take a test multiple times, um, our scores are likely to improve. And a good example of this is you know, your college entrance exams, whether it was the SAT that you took or the ACT test. Um, if you took it multiple times, there's a pretty good chance that, you know, your scores improved. Um, did they improve because you got smarter? No, probably not. They improved because maybe you were less anxious, maybe you um, were more familiar with the, the uh, format of the test, maybe you developed some test-taking strategies that, you know, caused your... Um, scores to improve. So your improvement had nothing to do with any kind of program that might happen uh, or that, you know, maybe you took a class or something, you know, your, your scores are going to improve just because of this testing effect. Uh, instrumentation, you know, we want to make sure if we're doing pre-test and post-test that we're using exactly the same instruments, exactly the same tools, 
if we're using um, uh, you know measurement devices like a scale or blood pressure cuff you know we want to make sure that those things are calibrated so that they're giving us good readings you know if, if some instrumentation changes from the pretest to the post test then again you might get some some different scores and the scores are because of the change in instruments as opposed to um, you know any changes in the participants uh, statistical regression um, that just means that individuals who do really really well on you know say a pretest or individuals that do really really poorly on a pretest you know are not likely to do as well or as bad on the post test um, you know there's going to be what's called a regression towards the center a regression towards the mean um, you know an example of this would be if we were trying to measure uh, people's free throw shooting skills in basketball you know we had two people and um, you know we've they're basketball players and if we look at the stats you know typically they're shooting you know maybe 65 70 percent which means that they'll make six to seven out of ten um, on a consistent basis well you know maybe the the day of the pretest, you know one person uh, has a really really bad day and they make um, you know eight out of fifty they're just awful uh, and then the other person, they have a really, really good day, and they make 48 out of 50. They just get in a groove, and they just start, you know, sinking one after another. Well, there's a chance, there's a, there's a good chance when you do a post-test later on that the person that did really, really, really well is not going to do as well. They're going to come back more towards uh, the center. And the person that did really, really, really badly is not going to do really, really badly again. They're going to come back again towards the center. So that's that concept of statistical regression that happens uh, when you're doing multiple methods or multiple multiple measurements. Uh, selection. Uh, that has to do with, uh, again, if you're allowing individuals to select themselves into groups, there's going to be some bias there. Um, you know, if you have a study, a fitness study, for example, and you ask for volunteers, you know, who's likely to volunteer? Well, people who uh, you know, maybe they're maybe they're already fit. Maybe they want to show off or something. Uh, so there's that concept of selection bias uh, that can affect internal validity if you allow individuals to self-select into groups. Uh, experimental mortality. It's not as ominous as it sounds. It just means that people drop out. Um, again. Participation in a program, participation in research has to be voluntary. We looked at that a couple chapters ago, and you have to allow them to discontinue at any time. And people who start a program, you know, for one reason or another, might not finish, and that can affect your results. Uh, you don't know who's, you know, who's dropping out, what are the characteristics of the people dropping out versus the ones that are staying in. And so you have this concept of, of losing people um, which is called experimental mortality. Uh, diffusion or imitation of treatments has to do with if you have multiple groups, an experimental group and a control group, and the, um, um, you know, the people in the experimental group, you know, maybe talk to the people in the control group, and, uh, you know, it can affect people's behavior. It's a funny thing. Um, you know, you might think it's it's kind of weird and it wouldn't happen, but it wouldn't be on this list if it didn't happen. A uh, couple of other things here, uh, interesting terms, compensatory equalization of treatment. Again, um, people in the experimental group versus people in the control group. The control group, you know, we're not dealing with animals here. We're dealing with people. People know what's going on. Uh, they talk to one another and they could... Um, um, they could do some things on their own, you know, so people in the control group, you know, they know they're in this study, they know that uh, um, another group is getting a program and maybe the program is designed to get them to be more physically active, to eat better, and so, you know, maybe the people in the control group start to do those things as well. Uh, compensatory rivalry, uh, again, is uh, people in the uh, control group um, 
you know, feel like they're being shortchanged, and so they may try a little bit harder on the tests in order to compensate for the fact that they aren't getting anything. And then uh, the last one is a kind of um, interesting term here, resentful demoralization of respondents receiving less desirable treatments. Um, you know, so maybe you've got, uh, you know, one experimental group that's getting a physical activity component and another one that's getting a nutrition component and maybe a third one that's getting both components. Um, and so, you know, maybe the other two groups are a bit resentful of the, you know, the one group that's getting both components and so that affects their behavior or affects, you know, how hard they try on, on the tests. I know it sounds kind of uh, weird, but uh, you know if these things weren't um, factors in research or in evaluation, they wouldn't be on this. Okay, so you have all of those threats to uh, internal validity that could uh, affect you know whether or not you can say that the change in the program participants was due to the program that we implemented, and so how do you control for that? Well. You know, the basic way of controlling for that or the best way to control for that is that concept of randomization. And there's really uh, three ways that you can um, include randomization into your uh, designs, your evaluation. You know, one is you can do a random selection of participants from um, the total set of the population that you, you know, want to study. Um, and then, you know, once you've randomly selected participants, then you can randomly assign them to the treatment or the control groups. Okay, so you've got uh, basically a two stage, two stages of randomization there. Random selection from the population and then random assignment to the, uh, to the various groups. And then a third way, and you saw this a little bit with that um, uh, one of that very complicated experimental design, but then you, uh, you know, you randomly assign the different types of, of treatments, okay? So, um, uh, you know, maybe that one group gets it at one time, and then another group gets it at another time, and so on and so forth. Okay, and so you know we looked at internal validity, and now uh, we're going to look at external validity. And external validity is um, you know the concept of can we generalize our findings, you know beyond this uh, group of people that were uh, participating in our program or beyond this particular setting. Um, another way to ask the question is if we do this again with some other group, will it work again? Um, Internal validity is a must-have. External validity, I would say, is a nice-to-have. Um, and so there isn't a, a long a list of threats to external validity, but uh, there are some uh, important ones here. Uh, social desirability, the expectancy effect, the Hawthorne effect, and the placebo effect. And uh, I'm sure some of these things are familiar to you. But the concept of social desirability is when the subject responds in a way that they think the experimenter or the evaluator wants them to. Um, so you know, an example of that is if I asked everybody in the class, you know, who brushed their teeth this morning? Uh, well, you know, even if a few people didn't do that, um, they'd probably raise their hand because it, the socially desirable response is, you know, you brush your teeth in the morning um, uh, before you come to, to work or to school. Um, the expectancy effect is when people act as you expect them to act. It was also called the Rosenthal effect. Um, and it was done, it, it named after a study in education that was done um, uh, I believe it was in Greensboro, North Carolina, but um, uh, teachers were told something about their students, uh, you know, in advance of them having those students. And, you know, in one case, the teachers were told that they were getting the high achiever group, and uh, other teachers were told they were getting the low achiever group, even though that wasn't true. You know, it was a typical class that had, you know, good students, bad students, and average students in them. And so, you know, the teachers had expectations of the students based on what they'd been told and, you know, how the students actually achieved 
uh, at the end of, of the period of time was because of the teacher's expectations. So, you know, the teachers that thought they had the high achieving group, you know, they uh, treated them as high achievers and lo and behold, they achieved really high. Uh, those that were told they had the low achieving group, you know, treated them that way and they didn't do as well. Okay, so uh, again, that's the expectancy effect. The Hawthorne effect uh, was named after an experiment that was done at, uh, you know, a factory. It was a lighting factory in uh, uh, Hawthorne, Indiana. Um, and you know, it's a pretty interesting study. Um, the, the, the researchers wanted to determine if we made changes in the environment, what impact would that have on the productivity of the workers? And so, you know, this was a typical factory, kind of dull and dingy, um, dirty. And so, you know, what they did was they, first thing they did was they went in and they changed the lighting. So they made it brighter in there. And so when they did that, the worker productivity increases, increased. Uh, so then they made some changes in, um, I think it was in the, in the work schedule. They allowed people to have more flexibility in when they took breaks, okay? So, uh, you know, they did that and productivity of the workers increased. Uh, and then they uh, decided that, you know, they changed the lighting and, and the walls were kind of a dingy green. So they went and they painted those a brighter color. Um, when they did that, productivity increased. They did a number of different things and everything that they did resulted in worker productivity going up, increasing. And so sort of like one of those time series designs that we looked at. Um, so then they said, well, where, you know, where's the end of this? Um, let's, you know, let's start taking these things away. And so they systematically returned things to the way they were. So they put the lighting the way it was before. And they painted the walls back the color that it was before. And they put people on the same, on the, you know, standard break schedule. And, you know, guess what happened? Um, and when I do a face-to-face -face class and I ask people this, they all say, well, you know, productivity decreased. Well, that's not true. <laughs> Everything that they did, whether it was uh, adding things or taking things away, caused productivity to continue to go up. And so the conclusion there and, you know, uh, why it's called this effect is that, you know, behavior was changing because the people were having attention paid to them. Um, it wasn't what was being done, but the fact that something was being done. So, you know, these factory workers were kind of living this, uh, you know, mundane type of existence, you know, coming to work, doing their job, going home. You know, here you had people that were in the plant and that were doing some things. And so, you know, that affected their behavior. Uh, it wasn't the things that were done. It was the fact that something was being done, that they were, you know, being paid attention to. And then we all know about the placebo effect, uh, and that's a change in, in behavior or something that can happen, um, uh, you know, when you think you're getting a treatment as opposed to actually getting a treatment. Um, this is done in drug studies all the time where, you know, one group will get the drug and the other one will get the placebo or a, an inert pill that shouldn't do anything, but you know, people will get better or they'll change if they think they're getting something that's going to uh, make them better or make them change. All right, and finally, uh, last slide of the semester, um, hallelujah. But so how do we control threats to external validity, uh, the concept of uh, blind in, in studies? So we have blind studies, double blind and triple blind. So um, in blind studies, the participants don't know whether they're getting a treatment or not. Uh, typically, again, in drug studies where, you know, one group is getting the drug and the other one's getting something and they don't know whether they're uh, in the uh, treatment group or in the uh, control group. Double blind is where the participants don't know which group they're in and the investigators don't know either. 
Okay, so the participants don't know if they're getting the drug or the placebo, and the investigators don't know if they're getting the drug or the placebo. So it um, you know, keeps you from, from treating groups uh, differently because you know that, okay? And then uh, triple blind is where you, the participants, the investigators, and the evaluators, if you have external evaluators, you know, nobody knows, okay? Um, you know, obviously, people are coded uh, so that you, you know, somebody knows at some point, you know, which... Uh, which people are in which groups, but uh, during the course of the of the experiment, um, uh, you know nobody knows, so that it eliminates any potential bias. Okay, so those are the the primary ways of controlling threats to external validity, which again is being able to produce the same kind of findings in um, another group of participants or in another uh, setting down the road. Okay. All right, well, that is uh, it for, uh, for this week and, and for the semester, and we will see you in class.